Hello, I'm Felicity Heal, and I want to introduce you today to two of the smallest treasures that the College possesses as part of our 450th anniversary uh, celebrations. They are a watch and a ring. The watch was supposedly owned by Charles I and the ring by Henrietta Maria. Now, Vice Principal Hardy, who wrote the old history of the college, published in 1899, had a short section at the end of the general history called Curiosities. And one of these curiosities was indeed the watch. The watch, he says, was kept in the principal's lodgings and is said, Hardy was a cautious man, is said to have belonged to King Charles I. And the signet ring attached to it belonged to Henrietta Maria. So I always imagine uh, Sir John Rees, who was then principal, showing the dinner guests these two treasures as they meandered around. And indeed, that's what still happens to this day, except that now the Fellowship keep the watch and the ring in the silver cabinet in the Peter North room, the old, old bursary, and show them to those who come in for dessert. The label that we have put on the curiosities uh, are that they are the possession, or were the possession, of Charles I and his wife, and that they were the bequest of Sir Leoline Jenkins. Now, I've no doubt that the latter comment is correct, that these two things came down to the principals and subsequently to the college at large from the bequest of Sir Leoline Jenkins, who was the most distinguished of our old principals in the 17th century. He doesn't mention these things in his detailed will of 1685, but they are almost certainly of the right period and of possessions that he would have passed to the college along with the vast majority of his estate. So, let me introduce you to the two objects. The ring first. The ring is perhaps the more straightforward uh, of these images and things to understand, because it was a mourning ring. Mourning for the death of a loved one um, was common enough in the period and was obviously used in a variety of ways, and rings were one of the ways in which mourning was expressed. The Ashmolean, the Victorian Albert, have a number of these mourning rings from the 17th and 18th centuries. But ones that have as you can see from the image on the screen, a painting of the martyred king on them are a very distinctive subcategory of mourning rings. And they were intended to signal to those who had been loyal to Charles that the wearer was one of their own. Indeed, several of those that survive in the Ashmolean have hinged lids so that you could, if you were mourning the martyred king during the Commonwealth or interregnum period, uh, you could then actually uh, hide away what was on the ring itself. Our ring is not hinged in that way, but it is, as I say, a common enough feature of the mourning ring. The ring image is a sort of debased version, as you would probably recognise, of a Charles I by Van Dyck. So, there we have the ring, uh, but without the hinge. It would be logical enough for Sir Leoline to have kept such a thing, because he had been a committed royalist throughout the Civil War period, and was in exile indeed for much of the 1650s something of a ring of this kind would have been something he would have treasured. Then to the watch, and the watch is more complicated. Gold of the 17th century, and most likely, as far as we can tell, of English make. These pear-shaped watches, uh, which come from this period, are often made in London, are often made with elaborate decoration of some kind on them. In the later part of the 17th century, pocket watches began to be more commonly made in round shape. So we have here something that fits rather neatly with the Leoline Jenkins period, and indeed with the period of Charles I. Many survivors, as I say, are elegantly engraved, but not this one. 
I wish that I could tell you something of a convincing kind about the maker, but there is a problem that it is actually extremely difficult and challenging to open the watch, and we have decided wisely, I think, not to do so on this occasion. We hope that in the future we might be able to uh, let the Ashmolean uh, take initiative in opening the watch. However, we might at least guess or hypothesize that it would have been made by somebody like uh, Edward East, who was the watchmaker to Charles II, and indeed, because he lived from the 1630s through to the 1690s, made some of his early watches in the Charles I period. It's said that Charles I himself was very fond of watches and gave watches as prizes for tennis games, but we don't have very much solid evidence to that effect. What else can we tell about the object itself? Well, it's got an interesting additional second style, which is unusual in this period and probably puts it late rather than early uh, in the 17th century. Much more interesting from the college's point of view, I think, is the fact that it is very well worn. When we take it out of its outer case, um, it shows dents and scratches and its outer case, which would have been used to protect it in most circumstances, has gilding, which, as you will see, has more or less worn away. I think we can assume that wherever it came from, it was much loved and much used by its owner. So, where can we go from there? Perhaps we should play the fake or fortune game. What can we tell about provenance? Were these objects actually touched by the martyred king? Uh, or can we speculate in other ways about the form of ownership? I, I can honestly say that we can only guess, but let me give you my own ideas. Let's start with Henrietta Maria, since it's unlikely that Jenkins would have been in direct contact with Charles I. Anything that came to Jenkins is likely to have come from the hands of Henrietta Maria or possibly Charles II, if it had royal connections. It's not clear that Jenkins ever met Henrietta Maria, but we do know that he had access to her possessions. The Queen Mother died in France in 1669, and she'd lived in France in her last years, having taken much of her jewellery, some of the art and other treasures with her when she retired to the French court. Most of these items were going to revert to the English monarch in the sense that they were part of state possessions. And so in 1669, Jenkins was sent with two of his colleagues to retrieve them from the hands of her youngest daughter, Minette, and also from the grasp of her husband, Monsieur, thoroughly loathsome younger brother of Louis XIV. The goods returned to England are recorded in a surviving inventory, which is in the National Archives, and they do include watches, although there doesn't seem to be much breakdown or detail given. Jenkins made a success of this mission, sensitive mission, on which he was sent, and he did so well that he was knighted by Charles II on his return. And it proved also to be the beginning of his major role as a diplomat and negotiator for the Caroline regime. Uh, and you'll see that in the painting of Jenkins that we have, he is holding the treaty which he negotiated on behalf of Charles II. It was in consequence of being translated, as it were, into an active diplomat that he finally had to give up being principal of the college in 1673. So, back to the watch and ring. I suppose one possibility here is that Jenkins was given these things as a reward for ambassadorial service, and in this case, presuming it was Charles II himself who allowed them to be passed to him, but we don't have hard evidence to that effect. I find that there are all sorts of other possibilities. Uh, I have already said that the rings were not that uncommon in this society. And the watch is so plain that it's perhaps surprising to think of it as actually being in royal possession. However, let us think perhaps in 1669, 1670, Jenkins is able to have access to these sort of items. How likely was it that they were directly owned or touched by 
the Queen Mother or by Charles? I don't know. It's very difficult to say. In the case of the ring and Henrietta Maria, all that I can suggest is that she was very cautious about displays of mourning of her, for her martyred husband. Um, this has been studied by historians in relation to how she handled some of the Van Dyck paintings that she had with her. And it may be that something as intimate as this was not necessarily something that she would have displayed. The watch, though, I don't know. I'm slightly more tempted, perhaps, to think of this as having been, at some point, in Charles's overall possession. Charles certainly loved timepieces. I mentioned earlier he may have given them as gifts. There's a famous story, which is, I think, reasonably credible, from his servant, Sir Thomas Herbert, who was with him uh, at the last days, about the king wanting an alarmed clock to rouse him on the day of his execution. That wasn't completed, but there was a royal pocket watch, or I think we would say more like a travelling clock almost, that was given to Herbert by Charles at the very end of his life. Other watches seem to occur in the story in different ways. There was a silver watch which was supposed to have been given to Charles while he was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight in 1647, um, and that was given to Colonel Hammond. And there's also an almost certainly apocryphal tale, which was repeated down the centuries, about Charles giving a watch to Bishop Juxon, who was with him on the scaffold, and that this was spattered with martyred blood and was handed down to his uh, uh, f family in the long run. There are almost as many timepieces, it sometimes seems, as there were places that Queen Elizabeth slept. Not quite. But there is a sense in which stories handed down in families uh, are not necessarily um, those that we would think of as convincing. I come back to the question of the plainness of the watch. Would it have been close to the person of the monarch if it is so plain? I'm not sure. But I suppose since he does have a collection of watches, it may well be something that was bundled to and fro between France and England uh, in the 1640s to the 1660s, and then emerged after Henrietta Maria's uh, death. Perhaps finally, I think it's more interesting to think of what it says about Jenkins himself. It says, of course, that he had a sense of abiding and strong loyalty to the monarchy, and particularly to Charles I and uh, his family. Uh, he lived on to serve Charles II for the last 15 years of his life. Uh, he was a strange figure in some ways to uh, be uh, uh, so key to the politics of the late Caroline court. He was sober, he was a lawyer, uh, he actively disliked many of the aspects of Charles II's court. It was said that he was, by nature, turned away from all the noise and glittering of a court. And in some ways, I think that's maybe what one can end up hanging on to in this story, which is that our watch, whatever its origins, reflects in many ways the man himself, a steady, hard-working, sober servant of the crown, and also, of course, somebody who rather badly needed to keep time well.